and welcome to the FF News Virtual Arena. I'm your host, Doug McKenzie, and on today's episode, we're going to be looking at finance apps and how they can stand out in an increasingly busy ecosystem. But before we start, I wanted to give a shout out to the facilitators of our discussion today, and they are Adjust. Adjust are a mobile marketing analytics platform trusted by growth-driven marketeers around the world with solutions, measuring and optimizing campaigns, and protecting user data. They power thousands of apps with built-in intelligence and automation backed by responsive global customer support. And it's because of them today we get to have this brilliant discussion. So joining me today, I actually have three absolutely incredible guests. And that is, we have from Google, Charlene Jolly. Charlene, how are you doing here today? I am good, thank you. How are you? Absolutely perfect. It's an absolute honor having you on the show here today. Uh, Charlene, can you tell our audience a bit more about your role at Google, please? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Charlene Jolie. I'm FinTech Apps Partnership Manager at Google in EMEA. And what that means is that I'm working with um, FinTech Apps in EMEA from investment, trading, banking, insurance, and so on. Um, and I'm helping them with their strategy, whether it is related to business, marketing, creative, and so on. And I'm also leading a few um, initiatives and projects within Google uh, in order to educate the ecosystem internally, but also externally on what to do, how to do it. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for appearing with us here today. And also, we have Jack Collier from Metal. Jack, how are you doing as well this Thursday? Yeah, good. Thank you, Doug. Absolutely amazing. And Jack, yeah, could you tell our audience a bit more about Metal if they haven't heard of you and, and, and your role there too, please? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Metal. I have been for, for over two years now. Um, Metal's the digital-only banking app by NatWest, and it's built specifically for businesses, um, sole traders, and side hustlers. Um, and we're sort of serving this growing trend of what we call the passion economy. And they're people who just want to take a bit more of what they do um, every day, whether that just um, that they love rather every day, whether that's just doing something a bit extra on the side to earn a bit of extra income, or whether that is to go full full hog and set up a, a business for themselves. And we're here to sort of cater for the financial needs that they have. That's absolutely amazing. And in this day and age, we're seeing so much of that ambitious, um, just extra, as you said, side hustles that are, are really um, coloring in the, the SME market. It's absolutely amazing. So thank you, Jack, for, for appearing here today. And also, last but not least, we have Michael Sherwood from Atom Bank. Michael, how are you doing here today too? I'm very well, thank you, Doug. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the show. Um, yeah, I'm Michael Sherwood. I'm Head of Digital Experience at Atom. Uh, I've been with the bank now for almost six years. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Atom is, um, Atom was the first bank built exclusively for mobile in the UK. So we're, we're kind of pioneers, I would like to like to think, in, in, in the fintech space. Um, and we're on a path to IPO and we've just made our, our first monthly profit. And um, yeah, it's great, to, it's great to see everybody. Yeah. And uh, I just having that, that brilliant experience, like the, I mean, the word you use, pioneer, you, you, you're so right. And it's so exciting to maybe um, pull some of the insights um, that, that you've, you've uh, had over at, at, at Atom for, for a while. I'm excited to hear that. So thank you so much, Michael, too. Now, to kick off then, guys, thank you so much for, for your introductions. But what are the most critical aspects of customer experience that consumers look for in a digital and a mobile banking environment? Jack, if I could come to you with that one first, please. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess my view on this is traditionally like banking has been seen as quite an antiquated sector. It's probably been at the back of the queue for innovation. Um, and yet I think people have been demanding more for quite some time. And you've obviously seen, uh, you know, the growth of um, these digital only uh, banks such as Metal uh, come to the forefront. And, and the things that we see, you know, we speak to our customers um, uh, all the time. Uh, and, you know, we have a, a star customer panel, which we uh, which we tap into and, and discuss uh, new features and feedback, etc. And, and the things that we hear time and time again um, needs to be simple and fast. Um, you know, we, if you imagine traditionally people would have to go into branches to open an account, it could take weeks. Um, often think you'd have a lot of back, back and forth account managers to deal with. It was just a cumbersome process, especially in the business banking sector, in the business banking world. And actually, you know, what customers are demanding now is a seamless onboarding experience that's digital only. They can open their account in a matter of minutes and start using the product. Um, and if you imagine, you know, we, we talked about um, side hustlers right at the start, you know, people just want to get up and go and do things, right? And, and do more of the things that they love. 
Um, and so, you know, they don't want they they want to actually deal with finances um, as, as little as possible, you know, and uh, and so that's why, you know, being simple, fast um, is, is really important. And I think the other side is um, just being integrated with all of the things that they use as well. Um, so when it comes to, to finances, you know, if if tax is obviously a big problem that people have um, and a big worry, it's, it's a source of anxiety for people. Um, they need to know that actually if the banking solution that they use um, can help support them with that, then that's just one less stress that they have to worry about. And mm. so they can just spend more more time doing the things that they do. Um, so I'd say those those two things are probably the biggest uh, aspects uh, yeah. from a personal experience point of view. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. You know, customers don't want to think about banking and you know, the old adage and, and the mantra is the fact that you don't buy a mortgage you want to buy a house um, and you know speaking of which I mean um, Michael over at Atom Bank I know you take huge steps to make that a lot easier for your customers so I mean do you, do you agree that that speed um, is, is is key for a customer experience in a digital and mobile banking environment? Sure it's it's base level though isn't it you know uh, I, I think now with the uh, you know the, the the huge rise of fintech in, in, in the UK, you've got, you've got base level expectations when it comes to the experience. Yeah. I think simplicity, um, speed, it's got to be secure. Um, but those things now are you know, not old hat. But if, if you don't have those things, then you're not going to you're not going to get your, your, your business off the runway, so to speak. Um, the one thing that we see and, and have seen since we went Went, went live kind of almost six years ago is that customers above all want value right so yes they expect you to do the best level things have great customer service your app needs to be quick and simple and easy to use um but customers want value for them. yeah um and, and i still don't think uh, that that all fintechs are offering that if, if i'm totally honest yeah, you know, you've got some fintechs that have, have are born through, uh, I guess, customer-led proposition design. Um, but how do you offer customers value? Well, you offer customers value by being as efficient and effective as you possibly can, and then passing that back onto customers in terms of better rates or charging less fees. Yeah. Um, and I think what we've found is that you can offer a great customer experience and you can offer great value at the same time. And the holy grail is you can also be a profitable business. Um, and we feel like the Atom mix in terms of bringing deposits in through a great ex onboarding experience um, and then being offered, being able to offer great rates for our efficiency and then being able to lend that money out the other side to businesses and residential customers through great value mortgages kind of ticks all the boxes it's a good experience offers value to customers but it also makes money for shareholders yeah and I, I, that's a really interesting thought to think that you know you can look at the a bank by reducing risk and, and internal inefficiencies can't just immediately pass them on onto the consumer and and you've kind of spoken to my next question there michael before i do in terms of customer demands but before i move on charlene i'd also love to get your perspective on this as well you know maybe uh, filtering in some of that conversation about how customer demands have changed from what is a base level in a, in a fintech app now and maybe what are some of the most critical customer experience points that, that they might look for mm, so that makes it a super long question <laughs> <laughs> so, i'm giving you the hardest one yeah <laughs> yeah um i'd say definitely i would echo uh, some of uh jackson michael's point to the like regarding uh the ease of flow and the fact that it has to be fast it has to be fast like users don't have time at the moment and especially we are on smartphone device so whether it is a banking app or anything tech app what i see now is like you must not have a flow you must be quick and easy to understand whether it is at the onboarding or after that and also as uh, mentioned before definitely security and privacy especially now with um all the issues that we hear people want to know that their uh, money or any you know um, finance related activity is secured but i would also add on top of that and maybe echoing uh, michael's point um i think value is really important and that's also why i think um it, it's basic but it's super crucial that your uh, product
that um, your solution, whatever you're offering must be at the core of um, you know uh, your communication and it really be, must be at the core of uh, your app as well. Um, and I think it also comes from what your vision is as a business, meaning that um, the, the, the fintechs I've working with that I've seen succeeding the most usually have a strong vision, which is we need to solve for that issue and because of that, we're building that product. And because of that, we're building an easy interface that can be accessible uh, to anyone and uh, communicating uh, around that and uh, being yeah, ad, you know, diverse and inclusive uh, around that. And I think you had the second question, which is the customer demand. So parallel to that was what I've seen in terms of customer demand. So just to give a bit of context, I've been working with uh, finance apps for almost uh, five years now. So it's interesting because i've seen it you know before covid even before you know it started picking up where um yeah it was different the demand but um it's been like two years and especially no maybe the, most three years and especially since covid that started like the demand has exploded um i mean we've all seen you know all these graph with uh it has exploded overall but it has exploded also across the different sub verticals which uh before when i was working with fintech apps it was mainly concentrated in um around uh, banking while now uh, users have become mature and on board with using you know apps to you know do all their uh, financial activities and on top of that it has also uh, spread across sub vertical but also across uh, geographies and different you know um demographics of people so there's it's really you know onboarded uh, by everyone but on top of that and that will be my like point i i can talk about it for hours but i will stop <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on top of that um i'd say because there's more and more players more apps as well what we what, what i see at least is um, customers are a lot more demanding and uh, their expectation is high so you have to meet their expectations yeah, and I think it's going to be such an exciting ecosystem to operate in from a customer's point of view to actually finally see some of these this kind of competitive landscape really flourish. And and uh, Jack, if I could come to you as well, because you know, we've heard from Michael and Charlie about the changing demands of the last two years. Have you seen any from, from Metal side as well? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's probably important to talk about, um, well, from a business banking point of view uh, anyway, um, the makeup of that audience has changed dramatically over the last couple of years. Yeah. Right? There are lots of people that have have sort of called out for a banking service to meet their um, change in, in income. Right. So a lot of people have been made furloughed and redundant over the last two years. You know, COVID is no, you know it's no secret, yeah. uh, and it's affected a lot of real people. And so they've had to change the way um, that, that they make a living to 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 earn money. Um, and that means that some of the traditional uh, banking solutions that have been out there just haven't been suitable for them. You know, lots of people who um, are effectively running uh, side hustles or becoming contractors or whatever it is, um, and running all of that, um, all those finances through their personal account um, and, and often convoluting uh, business and personal finances together. And actually it sort of shows that actually there's a, there's a new sector almost opening up, which is sort of overlapping you know, the traditional, you know, you're an entrepreneur and want to grow your business and people who are in the working world. And there's an overlap between those two things. And I, I genuinely don't believe a lot of uh, players in the market have really understood that yet. You know, and it's a it's a, a global trend of people getting up and doing more of the things that they love. And, you know, that can be various sources of income across various different platforms, you know, various different sources. And that creates new problems that that banks have to uh, and challenges have to solve for um, and that's that's really what we're, we're we're trying to do here at metal you know we think one of the core problems with that is tax you know people don't understand that um you know if they're earning multiple income from multiple sources and earn over a certain threshold they're eligible to to file a tax return in the uk you know and um and ensuring that they stay compliant is really important and and you know we we want to try that's just one of many different pain points that we want to, that we are solving for um but it's something that we're, that we're we're really looking into because we really think that that nobody out there is is doing a good job of it oh i think yeah as, as i was saying before i think it's so, it's so brilliant and to to re-examine everything including I know this sounds like such a grandiose statement, but there's a societal change that's happened in the last 19 or so months. Um, and already the digital transformations that were going on in finance apps that 
had to meet that new baseline, then have now having to accelerate again because and of this, those. This isn't going away, Doug. Either yeah. this is this is a trend that's that's go that's plowing forward. You know, more and more people are using you know passion economy platforms, Depop, Etsy, Vinted, it's just as an example. Um, and and the creator economy is is, is booming, and and the business and, and finance sectors need to keep up. Excellent. Now. Um, Michael, with that in mind then, and I'm really excited to hear Atom Bank's perspective on this, um, how have you seen the maturation of, of digital only um, banks change, especially from the app? So it can, I'd love to hear your insights on that. Yeah, sure. Um, in, in terms of, before I answer the maturity piece, could I just talk to the business Please. banking uh, yeah. and back to the value as well? So, so yes, digitization is absolutely key in terms of uh, getting you know, a quick yes or a quick no to customers. Um, but what we found is that during COVID, um, the way that we've kind of offered value back to organizations, but also to the, the, the country in, in general, is to subscribe to, to the civil scheme. So yes, we've got that kind of platform that allows us to get to a decision. Um, but we've now lent out over 400 million pounds to businesses that really, really, really needed it. Um, and, and, and that's kind of us trying to do our bit as a as a digital only bank. Uh, and, and many of those businesses may, may not uh, have been able to survive with, without, without that help. Um, so the things that really, really matter to customers are, you know, can can I can you give me a loan? And can yes, can you give me uh, quickly, but you know, you know, at the end of the day, the thing that matters most is the money when they see it in the bank account so they can keep trading. Um, other things to pick up on, uh, we, we talked about, in, includes, uh, Shine talked about in, inclusivity and, and diversity. Um, we, we've been working with uh, the Newcastle University um, on a program of work, um, looking at how we can harness technology to circumnavigate, if you like, the traditional ways of um, processing identification through through ID and B. Um, what we found is that there, there are a huge swathes of society that don't have a passport, don't have a driving license. Um, it find it really, really difficult just to get in the front door of financial services. And we we said, right, okay, well that's just wrong. So how can we how can we help? Uh, so we've been working on uh, a prototype which is up and running now, uh, which sits on the blockchain, um, which actually we're, we're starting with with, with vulnerability. Um, so think about you know the blue badge scheme or the, the the yellow lanyard scheme, right? A digital version of that, where people could kind of self-certify vulnerabilities into a, a super secure digital space, a wallet if you like, um, where organisations should the user decide it's appropriate, give access to financial institutions so that they could uh, see their vulnerabilities. And we took that one stage further and said, right, okay, so um, how could we use that to, to, to look at alternative identifiable credentials so that we could get people that would potentially, you know, not get in the front door of the bank, um, actually get through so we could, we could ID and be them by a non-traditional means. And again, we're, we're looking at that. It's a very similar similar process and similar prototype, um, whereby people would be able to self-certify, they'd be able to log in through Microsoft Authenticator, um, and we would be able to use other means to identify that Doug is Doug and Jack is Jack and Charlie is Charlene. And then we can bring them into the bank um, and then we can offer them that value that we were talking about so that could, um, kind of get on with their lives and, and, and improve their lives. So, um, so they're, they're kind of two big projects that we're looking at looking at, at the moment when it comes to maturity. Yeah. You know, over and above, is it fast? Is it secure? You know, does it work? Is it easy to use? We're now starting to think into the future about how do we really help people in society that need it, need it the most. And that plays to our purpose. Shani talked about purpose. Ours is very simple. It's the change bank if we're good. So yeah. it's, it's, it's forever, but it's in the main, it's for good. How, how can we really help people um, and also, you know, make money? You know, yeah. that's the, it, it's just, it's just good banking. Yeah. 
and it's from Jack's point and Michael yours as well just there um, there seems to be like a huge amount that has to um, go on in terms of financial inclusion you know getting access to these people alerting them that they that these apps exist um, you know Jack your, your instance of of um, you know informing people about the tax side of things Michael telling us about you know how getting at them to the people that need it the most it's going to be so critical as we see these apps mature now Shani and I also want to get your perspective as well um, you know as you said you, you've been in financial apps looking at financial apps the last five years I really want to kind of get that perspective of, of how you've seen seen them change in that time period from potentially the other verticals that you were looking at beforehand uh, yeah, so um, I'd say um, banking apps, but also overall now uh, fintech apps. I think they've really um, like it's starting obviously you know with a banking app. They've like set the bar in terms of uh, the quality, the security. Um, I, I'm really amazed, you know, by how uh, professional they are by working with them. But also they also set the bar in terms of like now users want to access their financial um, activities at any moment anywhere and under the form that they like so if you you know if you don't listen to your uh, users or potential users then it means you probably won't survive so um that's where i think they have started changing the space um, not only in the fintech app space but overall into the app space itself because also what, what we see as well there's more and more super apps so i know that uh, jack mentioned before spark they pop um these apps also have uh, onboarded like payment systems meaning that um, fintech is kind of like everywhere um and and the last point and going back to um you know like i think the inclusivity because I, everything is I guess you know something that I find inspiring with a banking a digitalization of banking but of finance overall is the way that it has democratized access to finance and to banking to anyone uh, it's more accessible now it's more diverse it's more inclusive and not only in terms of you know the demographics but also in terms of the geos like um i've been like i've been working with players for example um in africa where they're really trying they're really trying to uh, give access to bankings or macrons to um, the unbanked or people who are lacking financial literacy. You have apps uh, in the UK, for example, like uh, your Juno, who just launched recently. I think what they're doing is fantastic. They are retrying really to help, you know, women and non-binary people having access to finance and managing their finance and poor people. So that's really where I think, um, you know, banking and then fintech apps have changed the scene where it's the bar is higher the security, the ease of access is there, but also on top of that, it represents all the voices, all the needs. And uh, yeah, I really think that's that's amazing. And that has changed, you know, like the landscape drastically. Yeah. And speaking of, of that landscape, um, Charlene, I, I'm going to stick with you with this quite to, to lead with this question. And, you know, when we, we, we've obviously heard from Jack and Michael here about uh, you know, this digital is always at the core of, of what they do, but I'm interested to see your almost recommendations for traditional banks to stand out with their apps. I mean, what can they do uh, possibly against a digital only mindset? How can they ever look to get you know, customer acquisition in, in that? That is kind of when they're against a digital only mindset, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because it's a discussion that I've been having with some of the teams at Google recently who are working also with more uh, traditional high street banks and where um, now I think also the traditional high street banks from what I see are really on board as well on the digital side of things in the sense that they have their loyal existing customers. But the new uh, pockets of customers are also a lot more digital when we look at our generation and especially the next ones. Um, we don't like people, the younger generation don't always think to go to a branch. For us, it's like, OK, why? So I think the, the, the main things would be um, first, you know, encompassing, like building an app that encompass all the offerings that uh, they would have. Um, making sure you know that whatever they offer is accessible so digitally if possible obviously um, and so that their you know already existing and loyal customers can find you know what they are being always you know attracted to in that app and they can also uh, use the app if it makes sense for them um, and on top of that um, really trying to address you know that uh, those new um, audiences with the same you know uh, offering but uh, through an app and um, on top of that of course always you know have an 
you know, a product that is secure and also um, easy to navigate. And um, the last point I'd say is um, always keep a near uh, to your, listen to your users, um, to what they have to say, whether it is, you know, directly or uh, through the app store pages or through any, you know, social media. Um, if they are asking a lot for a certain feature or if there's like a certain friction, whatever it is, making sure that you uh, either add it or um, kind of like solve it because your users are the, are the one who have the power because as you know mentioned before uh, by Michael and Jack is um, if they are loyal they stick with your app but if at some point they're unhappy there are so many you know uh, whether it is banking or finance that make it so easy to switch to their products so uh, yeah make sure to listen to to your uh, users yeah now I, I, as a consumer, obviously, that would be incredible uh, to you know, have that constant feedback loop and, and actually be able to, to almost have a, a, a discussion with that you know, and, and learning from that. But uh, Michael, if I could come to you and conversely look at the, um, the, the features or functions, I know you've already kind of established that then the bar needs to be raised. But what are some of these features or functions that a digital only bank has to bring in the market to stand out now that it's becoming an increasingly crowded space? And what are the kind of what are the measurement standards um, for someone that isn't in the industry? What are those measurement standards that, that you look out for that, that highlight that your digital only bank is really succeeding when it comes to customer engagement and functions? Yeah, sure. There's, so there's a number of things to touch on here. I think end-to-end, -end, you know, journey time is absolutely critical. You, you've got to make sure that you, you can get into the bank, you feel like you can trust it, um, and that you can take out your product and service as quickly as possible. You know, speed equals trust, I guess. Um, in terms of security, security is an interesting one. You know, we very deliberately didn't go down the on-device security. We, we take a little bit of flack for it, actually. You know, why, why don't you just use the handsets, uh, you, you know, face ID? Or fingerprint well that's because we've got people's life savings right and you know i can give my 12 year old son access to my fingerprint if i want um it's not that we don't use on device you know we, we do if you don't have um face or, or, or um, fingerprint set or a passcode you can't download the app right simple as that that's how it, that's how it kind of first gate if you like yeah. but then we've got our own voice our own uh, face uh, and obviously we've got a traditional passcode um, which is set up when you register, but you know, they're bank locks. They're not device locks. We're not relying on Apple or, or Google to protect our customer servants. We've got our own bank locks and then we use those in multiple ways, depending on what you want to do with that. So, so security is absolutely key. And I don't see many, I, I know there's kind of monitoring and device tracking and what have you that ha happens in the background from, from banks that only use on device. Um, but you know, security absolutely key. What what are the next stages of security? Not not many people are talking about that. What does the future of security look like? Um, also, the, the bleeding obvious ones in terms of drop off rates. You know, uh, where are customers dropping off? Why are they dropping off? Uh, but all of that needs to be underpinned by a really robust and holistic voice of the customer program. Uh, we monitor everything. You know, every touch point we look at, every single uh, contact that, uh, that comes to the contact center. Uh, for example, we track it, and that's phone calls, app chats, emails, social, um, to understand where the failure is. You know, people don't phone call centers to, to, to praise you or just to have a chat. I mean, we have had that through COVID, but you know, in the main, people are phone because there's a problem somewhere. Yeah. Um, so we spend a lot of time in, in, in that space. And then we, you know, we monitor the app store, we monitor Trustpilot, we've got Revo, we've got bespoke surveys, and then we pull all of that complaints, and then we pull all of that data together, and then look at the app journeys and say, right, okay, how do we improve features? How do we improve speed? How do we improve security? How do we take demand out of the contact center um, by improving the app, which not only improves the experience but it reduces cost. So, you know, there would be just the, the, the high level pieces, but I think. You know, there's a big challenge for fintech overall to develop products and services and features that are really meaningful. Yeah. In my humble opinion, there's a lot of kind of features and products out there that are just a bit meaningless. You know, you just go, well, so what? That's just marketing, right? Is it offering value? Is it offering great service? Is it meeting a true customer name? Is it helping society? And there's a lot out there that just aren't. They're just marketing. Yeah, well, we've seen um, 
products. For instance, uh, with Revolut, um, there's a lot of, uh, in this kind of battle to make the, the plus card more re um, relevant, um, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, instances of, is it worth enough value for that? And I think that's gonna be a huge battleground um, going forward. And, and to your point, um, looking at security, Michael, Jack, if I could, come to you as well and do, do you think that's you know looking at security and especially for instance fraud over the last 19 months you know we've been talking about the the societal change that's happened fraud has been a huge change to through through digital apps and especially finance apps sorry um do you think that's going to be a key value proposition for fintech apps going forward absolutely i mean it's a, it's a hygiene point for sure and i think this is where um Starting, so the, the, the startup digital banks, um, you know, they're, they're having to learn this the hard way. You know, they're, they're set up, um, you know, using modern modern ways of working, modern methods, you know, um, and are, are definitely take a test in their mindset to, to how they evolve products. Um, but when it comes to FinCrime, there really, you know, there really is a zero tolerance. You know, customer, that, that can erode trust immediately, not just for that in the, for that one customer, but for the brand in its entirety. And I think this is where, um, you know, the, the traditional world and the, the startup world, shall we say, meet, you yeah. know, because traditional players like NatWest and others, um, you know, have have built these processes and these these policies from uh, over over hundreds of years, you know, and have, have, have learned a lot um, and know what the rights and wrongs are with this and know what the tolerance levels are. And so, you know, I do feel, um, uh, quite privileged to work at, at, at a place like Metal because, you know, we we effectively try to bring those ways of working and have the the setup within that West to operate like a startup. But we can leverage some of those uh, best in class um, best in class learnings from the bank to make sure that we we treat financial crime very seriously and make sure that customers' funds are protected um, and that we don't compromise on that at all. Because as soon as as soon as we let anything like that slip. The game's over, you know. And I think um, coupling that along with, um, you know, we talked a lot about um, the hygiene and value factors as well, um, and listening to customers and putting their needs at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and you know, we at Metal we use uh, agile principles and the jobs to be done framework to build our product. Um, and and customer customer feedback is uh, core core to all that. We evolve our product, um, you know, like a startup. Um, and, and the proof, the proof's out there, you know, like, like we've already said, trust pilot ratings, app store ratings, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that Metal's in the, in, in the, in the 4.8s across both app stores and, uh, and, you know, we, we, we hear great feedback across um, all of the social channels and, and feedback channels that we have. And, um, and I think really it's, it's, can you sustain that over a longer period of time? Because um, to Michael's point, I think there's a lot of marketing in, you know, out there um, and quite a lot of things uh, will be eventually a flash in the pan because yeah. they can't build long-term value and long-term security for customers. Interesting. And Charlene, do you have any um, input on that when it comes to how do you get the, how should FinTech apps finance apps get their their message across through marketing while not making sure it's just a, a flash in the pan you know do you have any recommendations to to fintech apps and how to stand out um from the crowd with their app um yeah i would say like if first and foremost and going uh joining you know michael and jackson on this point is like the the product is at its core and even like i've seen some as well you know where there's like the product might be a bit empty or lacking value for the users and you might have the best marketing but over time you know like uh, users will find out and um also with that, that i've seen the dynamic of you know sometimes there is um one you know finance app absorbing another one or two merging together when they have you know like um, um you know offerings that can be uh, combined uh so i think we are going more into like super apps type of world where a certain finance app is offering a lot more uh, financial services mm -hmm. it's a big trend at the moment um for example in asia uh i mean it's to a different extent where you have for example alibaba that has alipay that has so chat and everything um but aside from that to stand out so I'd say it will more and more be around, you know, like the values that you have and the community that you can build around these values in the sense of like, if you have, you know, two same products that are solving exactly the same way, who is it that you want to solve for and that should make you stand out? 
um, because we are also living in a world where um, and that's what I see, for example, with my finance apps. This has been, you know, increasingly with the case for the last few years where the, the, the app space is being really crowded. There's more and more players and with more and more offerings. Now, who has the power of the users? Meaning that if you're able to show, you know, what is your differentiation? Why is it that you're making such a product? And what ends makes you better for that, you know, a cohort of users? Then that's also how I think, um, you know, you can uh, stand out and um, also stand aside. And I think last but not least, and especially since uh, COVID is, you know, being empathetic and uh, trying to understand what are, you know, the challenges that user, users might be facing. Um, COVID has put, you know, a lot of people into a delicate, you know, uh, precarious situation. And I think the, you know, finance institutions that have been able to kind of like be more soft and more listening and be like, hey, look, uh, we hear you. Uh, we know you're going through a hard time. And this is what we've developed as a feature. This is what we are doing for you. I think that has really, you know, uh, resonated well with users because in such hard times, they're like, okay, those guys have been here, they've had our back, so we're going to stick with them. Can, can I can I just jump on a point, Charlie, Please. just made there around um, the super apps? You know, I think um, I think that's probably I would challenge that slightly in in what we're seeing at the moment. I'm, I mean. I think we're seeing a lot of uh, or, or demand for interoperability between different apps within or services within the ecosystem. You know, and a, a really good example um, we, we we have at Metal is um, our seamless integration with free agent accountancy software. You know, and that's yes, more positioned to sort of more of the the limited and, and growing growing businesses that have um, sort of more in depth accounting needs. But it's that deep, in, sort of unique integration that we have, and it's a seamless experience that we have that that we get some really great feedback on uh, and what one, is one of one of our large acquisition drivers as a, as a business and i think you know adding more of those that may not be within you know metal built but being able to transfer uh, you know your your core um proposition to uh, to other apps so you can interact with other apps seamlessly i actually see that as going down that route more um and and almost you know, you, you'll see your banking services is the center of that and, and feeding out into the other platforms. That's it. Will we get yeah, to a point yeah, of oversaturation? Sorry, Michael, to your point. Yeah, I was just going to make the point, though, but it, it depends on your purpose as a business, right? You know, the, the, the key thing that's going to make you stand out, um, for me anyway, is your conviction or lack of it. You know, what do you stand, what do you really stand for? You know, the technology is just there as a vehicle to deliver your purpose, right? Um, but if you lack conviction in your purpose, then, you know, customers will see through that. I'll give you an example. So, so Atom, as I mentioned, you know, set up the change back. So what does that mean in, in, in reality then? Well, you know, we just want to make it easy for people to save, right? And what we find is that, you know, the banking industry in the main has, has um, made it really difficult for people to save, but made it really easy for them to lend. You know, um, at um, at much higher rates of interest than are paying out to savers, for example, and that's how they make money. You know, we flip that completely on its head. So, you know, because we're super efficient, we can offer really great rates to savers. You know, and we can offer lower rates to to borrowers. Right? Completely transformed the banking model. But not everybody can do that, right? Because they've got a different purpose, or they, you know, they struggle to make money, for example. Um, and we want to take the, you know, make it really simple and easy for people to save one stage further. So we've launched our fixed savers, you know, re relatively traditional customer base in terms of fixed savers. But then we've launched our instant savers, so we're getting younger savers. But we want to take our proposition thinking and design to another place, which is almost the antidote, if you like, or the flip side to, to buy out pay later. You know, uh, we, we want to help people save now, buy later. So, you know, that for me is, is a differentiator. Um, we don't we, we don't have to find the income that other organisations are having to to search for and then go down a buy now pay later route, which in itself you know is um, it's an interesting debate around buy now pay later. Uh, many people seem to think that you know it's um, it, it's not that responsible in terms of a way of lending to customers. Um, so you know that that's our belief, our conviction is. We're going to focus on making it really easy for people to save, use technology to enable them to do so, and then educate young people on uh, why it's 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 as good, if not better, to save now and buy later than it is buy now, pay later. 
interesting. I, I think that's uh, uh, yeah, just a really thought-provoking point, and and space is one you don't hear a lot in banking and finance. Is is having that conviction um, is is so key to to well a KPI is at least. Um, an identity is going to be so critical going forward. But one thing that I, I've got to ask, and, and maybe Jack, if I could come to you with this one first, you know, how do you balance that user acquisition with user retention? Why are the two not in tandem with each other? Do you agree with Michael that you know, having that kind of core belief is how you, you get users and, and you keep them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Michael's spot on. I mean, you've got to have a, a, a valid and um, meaningful purpose as a business to be able to add real value at the end of the day. I mean, Metal's uh, purpose is to give people fun the financial confidence to turn what they love into um, an opportunity, yeah. you know, and that, that really goes to play on, like, like we talked about at the start, that this growing, you know, emerging trend of people earning money in a different way. It's not business, it's not personal finances, it's something in between. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm almost a little amazed that this that nobody's really picking up on this, you know, and the, the needs of, of those customers are, are so different. So, you know, our, our belief when it comes to acquisition, you know, bring, you know, inspiring people to try and join this movement that's happening, relating to them on an emotional level. What are the motivations you have to, to, to maybe want to join or start your own thing? What, uh, you know, what are, what are the journeys you go on to get to that point? How can we as Metal support you to be able to join this new revolution? Because we back it. We think this is the future, you know. We we think the traditional setup is is dead, you know, or dying, um, and so you know we're we're trying to to help people, you know, even before the acquisition, uh, you know, the acquisition stage to sort of champion these people, um, and I'm, and and the point around acquisition and retention not being in tandem, I think you know we 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 look at them quite intrinsically linked, you know, our acquisition you know, when we look at a retained user, we look all the way back to acquisition and we. We tie that, and I think being a digital-only um, proposition gives us a little bit of an advantage for that because we can we can build those views, we can look at the drop-offs, we can look at channels, channel mix, creative mix, whatever it is that's working well and not working well, and we can optimize and you know really build um, the right creative uh, and the right content to people to be able to get them from you know just a thought here to actually using the product and being part of the movement down here, um, and then just you know on retention specifically. Um, I think it's really important, and I think that the rest of the panel would echo this, that, you know, you've got to really understand if a user is, uh, you know, uh, lapsing, you've got, to, you've got to figure out before they lapse, what, you know, what are the signals to, that, that may make them lapse or, you know, that you can, you can get in before they lapse, because ultimately retention, when, they, when a, a user's gone, the likelihood of being able to get them back is, is, is practically zero. So it's looking at, okay, what are the signals that people have or gi are giving you um, so you can come in and have a conversation with them. So Charlene, I've got to hear as well, you know, your perspective on this. How do you um, find that balance between user acquisition and user retention too? I mean, do you agree um, that it really is that initial kind of engagement that you have that leads to constant re-engagement? Mm. Um, I'd say I'll take it, you know, from a perspective of being like a, a consultant to, to my fintechs, so obviously that differs, you know, from one um, fintech to another and especially from one sub vertical of fintech to another. But um, from what I've seen so far, um, user net new user acquisition is still very important because these are the new users you need to fuel and these are the users that also you need to keep engaged so that's not only through a strong onboarding but uh, by delighting them with uh, your offers and your features that's really important and as Jack mentioned like usually when they drop off uh, it's hard to get them back in so you want to keep them engaged um, as much as you can but um, in parallel of that, uh, you know, sometimes, and what I've seen with a lot of my fintechs is that there's a new feature or there's a change uh, in the flow or any of the functionality. So in that case, in that sense, and I mean, overall in any way, um, having a user acquisition, net new user acquisition combined with um, re-engagement strategy is really helpful so that you can make sure that any users that might have dropped off or has new users that might be a bit dormant for a while, you can re-engage with them and make sure to bring them back to your product. 
absolutely amazing yeah and, and having that, that conversation and i will bring up earlier in the in the conversation as well but having that continued conversation with your customers i think is going to be uh, such an important thing in an embedded finance world of being able to actually talk with your customers as the product changes um, and inform them and have that discussion is going to be be critical and, and michael i i I've slightly put words in, in your mouth by uh, moving on to this question saying that you know having a core belief system at your your organization might be key to user acquisition but you know do you do you have any uh, echoing statements on that or do, you know do you agree with what's been said so far? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's about trust, isn't it? You know, mm. Right at the top. And again, you know, when just my perspective on this, you, when it comes to your convictions and doing the right thing, you either mean it or you don't, right? Um, and organizations that really, really mean it and really, really want to help customers and want to harness the technology to do so will win, yeah. right? Because it, it, it bleeds through the organization. It doesn't matter whether it's the marketing of products, the building of products, the journeys, you know, the full shebang. Customers will know that you mean it. And as a result, they will trust you. And as a result, they will join you and they'll stay with you. Um, but I think you know, I touched on this right at the start of the conversation. You have to offer them value as well. Right. So, you know, we're in banking and finance. It's about interest. It's about growth. And if you can't offer them value, then and you ha you can't offer them conviction then what have you got to offer them other than marketing so uh, and when it comes to to us we've got a belief that kind of you know, sits below our top level belief statements which uh, you know we want to offer uh, um, customers you know value service but overall goodwill and we believe that if you show goodwill it will be returned and that's what we're seeing um and talking specifically about about retention um, and back to journeys when it comes to our servants proposition it's really easy to join us but we also it's also really easy to to leave us as well um so you know we notify you well in advance using notifications as to when your fixed term deposit is coming to an end um we don't hide it or try to renew people through inertia um, and then once we give them uh, the notification up front, we then make it really easy to understand if there's a better deal with us. And we'll, they can do that in the app and they can renew with us in the app at like a click of a button. You know, it's so easy to roll over uh, to, to a new product. But it's equally easy to take your money out and go somewhere else. You know, so. it, that seems very. Um crystal clear um, and having that, that frank discussion and open discussion with your, your customers just sounds like uh, such a, a positive uh, movement in finance and I, and I just absolutely all for it I think it sounds amazing now Charlene if I could wrap things up and come to you with our last question of the day and I really want to get your biggest prediction um, for the, the finance app ecosystem going forward where do you think where do you see some of the innovations coming up Ah, big question. Um, I'd say that <laughs> definitely, you know, from my perspective, I think that um, the the usage, you know, will keep increasing, and will go into even more some vertical of fintech um, and towards more demographic, will expand more geographically, and I'm very, you know, excited to see that happening. Um, it will like fintech will also be embedded into almost every app. Um, and um, I do think that it will keep, you know, being uh, more diverse, more inclusive and especially fulfilling this kind of like, um, you know, like purpose of, you know, just helping people with whatever challenges that they might be facing, uh, but just helping people, empowering them to kind of like make their finance work for them to have a better life. Uh, what a brilliant go on and it, it's such a refreshing um, kind of topic to, to talk about within finances is it's yeah, you know, almost a um, similar echoing uh, Michael's at a bank, you know, making you know, finance for good and everything. And and with that in mind, then Michael, um, do you, do you have any kind of crystal ball thoughts on on where you see the finance app ecosystem going forward? Yeah, it's not really a crystal ball. You know, I touched on it earlier. I just think the whole industry needs to get behind, you know, making finance more inclusive for people. You know, a pound is a pound. Right, it, it shouldn't matter where you live, what your background is, you should have access to financial services. Um, 
and I talked earlier about the work that we're doing with Newcastle University on alternative identification and verification, and also in terms of you know making people, financial institutions aware that you're a vulnerable customer. We can't do it on our own, um, and we need the government on board because we could get a central, uh, a decentralised, centralised database that could help us overcome some of these challenges, but. The government has to want to do it. The banking industry has to want to do it. And we can do it. We're proving it. We know we've, we've got a prototype up and running, um, but we can't do it on our own. So it's it's not so much a crystal ball. It's a, come on guys, you've got to wake up here. Um, all of a sudden it's, um, you know, it's fashionable to be good, right? And you know, I'm not knocking it. It's about <laughs> time. It's about bloody time, right? So let's ride that wave and let's make some real change. I think that's absolutely brilliant and, and to draw out you know, onboarding and it's knock on effect for financial inclusion and then ultimately partnerships. I think I can completely agree. I think we're really going to see them so, you know, uh, cascade into, into more exciting innovations and helping so many more people get access to finance. And, and lastly, Jack, um, yeah, did, don't know if you had any wrapping up thoughts um, on, on the kind of future of finance app ecosystem too. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, just leave with the point that <clears throat> I think a lot of players within the fintech space at the moment are um, are, are, move, are get get caught up in the trap of um, doing things that everybody else has done or doing things that uh, you know following the traditional path. And and actually, to, to what the panel's been talking about in general, you've got to forge your own way, and you've got to forge a way that customers can relate to and people can relate to. And I think just echoing on the, the passion economy point and the creator economy point, that is a movement that I don't think many people have picked up on that is happening right now across the UK, that is the most inclusive movement happening because it involves all people from all demographics, all shapes and sizes, all locations. And it's just people who are wanting to do more of the things that they love and turn it more into um, their income. And I think um, the more that um, the industry can do to support them, I think the better. And thinking outside of the traditional uh, framework that we currently see it in. Yeah, no, it's not lazy money. You know, it's for it's for the hard grafters. Um, it's like brilliant, guys. I, we've come to time. Thank you so much for all your inputs. It's been such a fascinating topic, um, and obviously the app is right at the heart of all these uh, you know, digital only banks. And so it's so important to discuss. So I'm just absolutely thankful for you guys appearing here today and also a massive thanks to our viewers as well you can catch the rest of the series and much more over ffnews.com of course youtube but especially linkedin where you'll see me in the comments so michael charlene jack thank you so much once again i hope you've had a good time and goodbye